All right, you guys ready? Whoop, whoop. All right, Gavin. We're, uh, we're small this morning, but I'm about to preach. I'm ready to go. We still got the word, right? And so we are men and women who love the Word of God, who need the Word of God. I uh, was thinking this week, even as um, Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, when he's quoting Deuteronomy, he's being tempted, and he quotes Scripture, and he says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so... Here we go. This is the word that's come from the mouth of God. This is, this is our sustenance. This is what we need for nutrition, for godly living. And so why don't you go ahead and open up your book and make your way to Genesis 39. Um, so looking across, I, I guess we're, we're good to go. All right, I sent some of you guys a, a message. Um, we, got, we got a mature subject this morning in the text. Um, we have a message of, of scandal and of seduction, um, but it's for us, right? This is God's word, and so we don't skip around the parts that are awkward. We dive in knowing that, um, that this is for us, that it's relevant for us. And so continuing on in our sermon series that we've entitled um, Unexpected, How God Works um, in Unexpected Ways in the Life of His People, uh, and we're looking at the life of Joseph, right? We're going back, rewinding to the Old Testament, looking at the life of Joseph. Uh, certainly a case study in how God works in unexpected ways. I love this story. And so we kicked it off last week in Genesis uh, 37 as we were introduced to this character, Joseph, who was one of 12 boys, 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, Joseph was number 11 in line, so he was not the youngest, but the, the second to uh, second from the bottom, but he was Jacob's favorite, right? Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. He favored Joseph. He made Joseph this really cool, colorful coat. Um, and as you can imagine, Joseph's brothers didn't really care for him, right? Like, who's this little guy that, you know, got that dad thinks he's awesome. And, and then he's having these dreams. You remember we, we talked about two dreams last week that he had essentially saying, hey, brothers, I had these dreams that you guys are going to end up bowing down to me. You're going to worship me. I don't know. It's just, you know, God's giving me this vision. I'm going to end up ruling over you, reigning over you. And as you can imagine, that, that made the, his brothers even more mad. And so what we saw last week is, is uh, Jacob sent Joseph off to the fields to go check on his brothers. Hey, they're, they're shepherding the flock somewhere. Why don't you go find them, check on them, make sure they're okay. Joseph shows up. They see him from a distance with that shining coat. And they've been grumbling already. They hate this guy, and hatred is continuing to well up in their hearts. And they decide, man, let's just kill the dude. Let's just get rid of him. We're out here in the middle of nowhere. All right, I'm sick of him, sick of his arrogance, sick of his, you know, him being favored. Let's just get rid of him. They decide to kill their brother uh, until Reuben, the oldest, steps in. They're like, hey, come on. Like, I know we're fired up right now, but let's not kill. Let's just throw him in a pit. All right, we'll let the animals devour him, die of starvation, whatever it is, but we don't need his blood on our hands. Let's just kind of throw him in a pit. And so that's what they do. They, they strip him of his robe, throw him in a pit, and uh, they're eating lunch, laughing, having a good time. Well, Joseph's like, hey, guys, what's going on? Right, until finally this band of gypsies comes by, this band of Ishmaelites, and the brothers are like, hey, let's just sell him. Like, like, we could kill him and, and not profit from him, or we could sell him to the Ishmaelites. He's going to be gone. They'll take him far away. We'll never see him again. It's like he's dead, but we'll make some money uh, in the meantime. And that's what they decided to do. 20 shekels of silver that they sell their brother. They turn him over to the Ishmaelites who are on their way down to Egypt. And so that's where we ended last week, right? That was where the, the curtains closed. That was the end of Act 1, fade to black. Jacob is, is bawling his eyes out because his favorite son is dead in his understanding. And Joseph is being led away um, in chains to Egypt. And so that's where we quit last week. That's where we're picking up this week in Genesis 39. Uh, Joseph arrives in Egypt. Um, now, we don't have the details. This was, this was about a 200-mile journey from where they were. All right, so this would have been a, at least a couple weeks that they were traveling, that Joseph is just trying to figure out what, what is going on. Right? And they finally arrive in Egypt, and Egypt is unlike anything that Joseph has ever seen. Egypt is the most influential power in the entire world at this time. Um, Egypt was a place of great wealth, uh, luxury, technology, uh, military might. 
and the culture was completely different than anything that Joseph was used to. All right, the, the food was completely different. The music, like it was just, it, it was completely different. The, the uh, language was different than what Joseph knew. And the religious system was completely different. The Egyptians served a bunch of foreign gods. And so Joseph was the epitome of a stranger in a strange land. And what we see here in verse 1 is that Joseph is sold as a slave. All right, now, Joseph is not just any slave. He's a Hebrew shepherd slave. And that's like the trifecta. That's like the lowest of the low. The Egyptians hated um, the Hebrews, and the Egyptians hated shepherds, even Egyptian shepherds. They're like, keep them out. You know, they don't need to, they don't need to come near us. We don't want to deal with them. Uh, just, they're, they're, they're just the outcast of society. And so here we have Joseph, who is a Hebrew slave, the lowest of the low, and he's purchased by the highest of the high. Right? Look at verse 1, chapter 39. It says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of his guard, an Egyptian, had, brought, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. All right, so again, Egypt is the powerhouse kingdom of the entire world, and Pharaoh is sitting at the top. All right, Pharaoh's the king, Pharaoh's the president, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh thought that he was a god, and there were many people that, that worshiped him as a god. And his right-hand man is a guy named Potiphar, and Potiphar is a guy that ends up purchasing Joseph as a slave. Uh, it says here that Potiphar was the captain of the guard of Pharaoh. Essentially, he was, he was the chief of police. All right, he was, um, he was probably the head of the security team for Pharaoh. And this is the guy that purchases Joseph. Now, what I want to do right here after verse 1 is I want you to put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Okay, here's what's interesting about the Bible and especially the Old Testament. Hebrew literature usually doesn't give us a whole lot of details. It usually doesn't give us insight into people's feelings, people's emotions. Uh, it's just kind of this happened and then this happened and then this happened and sometimes they skip entire years in between. But imagine inserting yourself as Joseph at this point. All right, he's probably thinking, like two weeks ago, I just went out to find my brothers because dad asked me to go find them, right? Life was going well, everything was good, I'm wearing my favorite coat, right? Daddy loves me, and now I'm like a slave. And everything changes. Um, he's thinking, this is, this is it for the rest of my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the rest of my life in slavery. Um, his world was just turned upside down, right? He's like, is this, is this a dream? Like, what just happened? How did this happen? How did I get here? At the depths of discouragement and depression and despair, Joseph's life is forever changed. Um, a stranger in a strange land. He doesn't know a soul. He's completely alone, except for... Look at verse 2. Except for the Lord was with Joseph. All right, now we read that, and we might just kind of read right over that, right? Like that's just some kind of, you know, biblical, like we hear that all the time, right? Like, yeah, I know, God's everywhere, God's with him. But, but even if you think about it, you're like, okay, so what? Like, is that supposed to be some sort of consolation prize? Like, Joseph lost everything. Right? He lost his entire identity, his family, his friends, his, his, his wealth, everything that was to be his. But God was with him. And we can read that and we're like, okay, yay. I mean, I get, you know, not trying to, not trying to, you know, whatever, be heretical here. You know, watch out for the lightning bolts, but is that supposed to make him feel better? God was with him. What we see here in this verse is that through the darkest season of Joseph's life, God remained faithful to Joseph. That's what he does. That's who he is. He's faithful. And what we're going to see, and the question that we should ask is, in the midst of the darkest season of Joseph's life, will Joseph remain faithful to God? And so let's read on here. I'm going to read verses 2 through 6. And as I do, I want you to see how quickly things change. Okay? How unexpected this becomes. 
So Joseph is purchased. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master, Potiphar, and Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in the sight of Potiphar, and he attended him. And he made him, Potiphar made Joseph the overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge and because of him, he had no concern about anything except for the food that he ate. Okay, <laughs> now that kind of makes me laugh because this is so Potiphar's like he's looking around and he's like, man, you're a stand up guy. Like I've never had a slave like you before. There's something different about you. Um, you're, you're a guy who's dependable. You're a guy who who's responsible. You're a guy who has integrity. Like, like it's unusual. And I'm going to put you in charge of everything because I trust you. And it's hard to find someone that's trustworthy. All right. Here's the keys to the house, Joseph. You're in charge of everything, except for my food. Don't touch my food, right? He, like, like a typical guy, he, he wants his food the way that he wants his food. But he puts Joseph in charge of everything. Now, we talked about this a little bit last week, is that when we're looking at the Old Testament, when we're looking at narratives, um, there's often many practical lessons that we can learn, good solid biblical lessons that we can learn. Um, and so there, there's two in this chapter that I want to point out to you, and then we'll kind of tie a bow on this entire chapter by kind of revealing the, the big, uh, the big gospel centered implication for our life. All right. So we're going to work towards that, but here's the first practical lesson that I think we can see and should see in this text. Work hard, work hard. If you're taking notes, write that down. Underline it, circle it. Work hard. All right, this is, this is a man of character. This is a man of integrity. And if you think about it, again, he had every earthly reason to throw in the towel. To be like, man, this is stupid. I ain't nobody's slave. I'm not trying to be your slave. Like, I was a free man just a, a couple weeks ago. All right, I'm not working for you. Do whatever you want. Sell me to someone else. Throw me in prison cut my pay. You're not paying me anything anyway. Like, why should I, why should I work for you? Kill me if you want. I got nothing going for me anyway. But instead, Joseph, a man of character and a man of integrity, works hard. He obeyed the command of God through the apostle Paul that Paul would write a couple millennia later to the church, uh, to the Colossians, when he says, whatever you do, work heartily. Whatever you do, whatever your job is, whatever your task is, whatever you're doing, work heartily and work as unto the Lord, not as unto man. That's the command, right? Whatever God has given us, whatever your job is, whatever you engage in, you are to do it with all of your heart. You are to work hard. God honors hard work. We see that over and over again in Scripture. God honors hard work. It doesn't mean you're going to get a promotion next week. It doesn't mean that you're going to make a million bucks. But God sees you. And God honors hard work. And so even as we consider our jobs, like you might be like, well, I don't like my job. Okay? You can still do it faithfully. You might say, well, but, but my boss is a complete jerk. Okay, well, don't work for him. Work, do your work as unto the Lord. Right? Well, I don't find fulfillment in my job. Well, you're not supposed to. All right? You're not supposed to find fulfillment. The purpose of a job is to make money, to provide for yourself and for your family. I mean, hopefully the Lord might give us some joy in doing so, but the purpose is so that we can provide for ourselves and that we can honor the Lord as we do so by our work ethic. Um, Christians should be the best employees at their job. We should be the best employees. Um, your boss should look at you just like Potiphar looked at Joseph and said, man, you're a good employee. I like having you around. There's something different about you. Thank you. You're, you're doing a great job. And you would say, oh, well, cool. Thank you. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. And I'm just trying to honor God. Right? 
And they're like, yeah, but but like everyone else, like they steal or they you know they're they're cheating the the, the time sheets. It's like, oh well, I don't. I mean, I I love Jesus and I'm just trying to honor God. Yeah, but like other people are gossiping. I, I notice that you just kind of withdraw from that. Well, I just, I think that's kind of sinful. I don't, you know, I, I want to honor God, right? Well, well, y- y- you show up on time. You know, you're even five minutes early. Well, I just, I'm trying to do my best because I love Jesus and I'm trying to honor God, right? You, you don't call in sick when you're not sick. That's what people do. Well, I don't do that. That's a lie, right? I'm a Christian. I love Jesus and I'm just trying to honor God. I do my work as unto Him. I'm not sure if you've noticed but there are not a lot of trustworthy people in this world. By and large, there's not a lot of dependable people in this world. There's not a lot of selfless people in this world. There's not a lot of hardworking people in this world. And that's what we're called to be. We're called to be different. We're called to represent Christ and we're called to honor God as we do it. And so you should be the best employee at your job. When you clock in, you should be thinking, how can, I, how can I work so hard and bless other people? How can I be a blessing to my coworkers? How can, I, how can I be a blessing to the customers? How can I be a blessing to my boss? Right? Oftentimes, we've kind of been taught that we clock in and, and we expect everything to go well and people better not mess with me. All right? I'm, not, I'm not here of my own free will. Like i got to be here. I don't want any trouble. Like Other people better make this easy on me. What if our perspective was different? Um, even I, I was thinking as I was preparing this, to I, I knew we'd have a bunch of young people here this morning. I, w- I would look at you guys and tell you, learn how to work, learn how to work hard. Your generation, I'm just going to say it, your generation is lazy. Um, and my generation is a transition, right? Like my dad and granddad, like I hear stories of when they woke up and how hard they worked and, and then something happened and we've become a generation that just wants to be entertained and a generation that's entitled and nobody knows how to work hard anymore. And if you want the favor of man and the favor of God, when you get a job, work hard. People will notice. Maybe I should even say before you get a job. And get some amens from the parents, right? Well, you're around the house. Whatever you're called to do, work hard. Like, sweat a little bit. It's good for you. Um, when you're faithful with a little, God will entrust you with more. That's biblical. When you're faithful, when you're hardworking with a little, God will give you more. All right, because everything is God's. And if you're stewarding it, stewarding it well, if you're managing it well, then God's going to notice, hey, that guy, that gal can handle a little bit more. I'm going to entrust her with more. I'm going to give her more responsibility because she's honoring me. She's glorifying me. He's working hard. He's diligent. He's a man of integrity and character. This is what happened with Joseph. He was faithful with a little, and he was entrusted with more. God blessed him. We see the word blessing twice here in that, in that uh, passage that I just read. We see the word success here twice in that passage that I just read. Um, and there's an important lesson in here for us, is that we are to be men and women who work hard. It's as simple as that. It honors the Lord. Here's what I'd say is that work is not a curse. All right? Sometimes we look at work like, man, work stinks. You know, why did Adam and Eve have to sin? What I'd remind you is that God gave us work before sin. Genesis chapter 2, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden and he gave him work. He, he put him in the garden to work it and to keep it. Right? Work is not a curse. Now, the curse came, they sinned, and the curse came, and work has become a little bit more laborious. There's some thorns and thistles, and there's some sweat on our face. Right? But work is what we've been created to do. It's one of the ways that we can honor God by doing what He's created us to do and by doing it well. And so we read on in, in verse 6. And at the end of verse 6, there's an interesting little sentence here. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Okay, now this is just seemingly random, but it's also seemingly ominous. Right, like, uh-oh, what does that mean? Boy's got good looks. He's actually got the looks of his mom. This is it's the exact same thing that we read in Genesis 29, 
uh, Rachel, remember Jacob loved Rachel because she was beautiful. It says the exact same thing. Rachel was beautiful in form and in appearance. Joseph is handsome in form and in appearance. All right, it's a general, generational curse we were talking about last week. Good looks. It's hard. It's hard for some people. That's what I've heard. But why does it say this? Why does it say that Joseph was handsome? It's almost like, uh-oh, what's coming? What's coming next in the story? Let's look at verse 7. It says, After a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. Lie with me. Come to bed with me. Now, again, put yourself in Joseph's shoes here. All right? This is a brother who is frustrated, discouraged. His whole life has been torn apart, turned upside down. He's lonely. And this woman of prominence and wealth and power is probably, probably good looking. Says, hey, Joseph, come on. Come to bed with me. What do you do? This is speculation, which can get me in trouble. But here's what I imagine. I imagine that Joseph stares at her for at least five seconds before he says anything. And I imagine those five seconds probably seem like five minutes because I can only imagine his heart is racing, his palms are sweaty, blood is pumping through his body, and the wheels are turning in his head. And I can only imagine all that he's thinking. My word, didn't see this coming. It's an opportunity. Um, maybe I deserve it. My life has kind of been rough, not what I expected. It's not like I'm coming on to her, she's coming on to me. And I'm her slave, like, shouldn't I do what she's telling me to do? Like, all these things that are probably going through Joseph's mind. And here's some more speculation. Joseph wanted to. How do I know? Because I'm a guy. Okay? And most guys are not the, it's, not, it's usually not guys that are running to HR filing a complaint for sexual harassment. Right? Like all these things are going through Joseph's mind. What is happening? And finally he responds in verse 8. But he refused. He refused. He said no. He didn't give in. And here's what I want you to see. He didn't joke around about it. He wasn't flirtatious about it. Like, ah, Miss Potiphar, stop. You know, we can't do that. Goodness gracious. Like, what if Potiphar comes? Like, no, geez. Like, that wasn't it, right? He didn't leave the door open. He shut the door. The answer is no. I'm not going to do that. He was a man of conviction. And in verse 9, we see what the conviction was behind the refusal. Look at verse 9. It says, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? This was the foundation of Joseph's determination to say no. This was the plumb line under which Joseph decided what he was going to engage in and what he wasn't. It's sin. And he understood that he was directly accountable to God for his actions. He understood that his sin was ultimately committed against God himself. And with that conviction came his commitment to purity. He said no. Look at verse 10. And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. All right, this is a woman who's persistent. This is a woman who doesn't like being rejected. This is a woman who usually doesn't hear no. All right, oh, now it's on. Now it's a game. All right, persistent day after day after day after day trying to wear him down. But it says that not only would he not sleep with her, but he wouldn't even listen to her. It's like, woman, stop. I'm done. I'm not hearing that. All right, I've already told you. The answer is no. I'm a guy who serves Yahweh. I'm accountable to God. 
That's sin against the very heart of God. I'm not going to do that. But, look at verse 11. But, one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and nobody else was around, like again, ominous almost, right? You're like, oh boy, here it comes. But this one day, just so happened that nobody else was around. I imagine that Potiphar's wife had something to do with that. He's going about doing his work. In verse 12, she catches him by the garment, and she says, lie with me. And at this point, it's almost a command, right? Like, I'm sick of being rejected. We've purchased you. And, and honestly, at that time, some of the slaves were expected to engage in sexual acts and sexual favors for the people who purchased them. It was not uncommon at the time. And Potiphar's wife grabs him by the coat and says, lie with me. And what does he do? He runs away. He literally runs out of his coat. Right? She's holding the garment. He wiggles out of that and he runs away. Here's the second practical lesson for us. Run away from sexual temptation. Now, I could just as easily say, run away from temptation, and that would be a fine application. But it's specific here, and I think it's okay for the application to be specific as well. Run away from sexual temptation. Everybody faces sexual temptation. All right, it's not only men. All right, yeah, it's man's greatest battle, every man's battle, whatever. It's every person's battle. We are all sexual beings. That's how God's created us, and therefore we will be tempted sexually. Run away. Flee. There's something unique about sexual sin, is what the Bible says. All right, we like to say, like, all sin is the same, but the Bible says, no, sexual sin is different. Mason, put that 1 Corinthians 6 verse up. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. There's something unique about sexual sin, and there's something unique about sexual temptation. Um, sexual temptation will find you, and it will blind you, and if you're not prepared, it will bind you, and it will grind you. All right, there's a poem for you. Sexual temptation will find you, it will blind you, and if you're not careful, it will bind you and it will grind you, it will destroy you. That's what it does. But there's good news. Mason put up that other 1 Corinthians verse. The good news is that God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we can escape. You will be tempted. But God's promise to you is that you don't have to give in. Even when it seems insurmountable. Even when it seems like, how in the world can I deal with this? How in the world can I stand up and say no? God's giving you provision. God has given you an exit ramp. God has given you an escape plan. Flee sexual immorality. I want to say something that might be controversial. Um... I believe that we should have a premeditated refusal towards sexual immorality. Here's what I mean by that. If you're not prepared, it's going to be really hard, near impossible. I believe that we should almost, like when I say put yourself in Joseph's shoes, like think about that happening to you. Consider that that might very well happen to you. Consider that that will happen to you at some point in your life. What are you going to do? When I became a pastor, I'm not, I'm not blind to the statistics. Like, I've seen pastor after pastor after pastor fall into sexual immorality. And one of my biggest fears, becoming a pastor and answering the call, was I know I'm going to have a bigger target on my back. Like, I just know it. And I know that one of the biggest ways that the enemy works is through sexual temptation. And so I started, and again, this is maybe where it's controversial, but I started playing out situations in my mind. 
hey, what if this happens? What if this woman walks into my office and closes the door behind her? What if this woman says this to me? What if this woman, you know, comes in and, and has a few more buttons unbuttoned on her blouse? And again, it's not that, you know, we're not playing out details here in some kind of weird fantasy, but it's preparing yourself for what you will do to honor God. And I think it's good and well that we do that. Like we do that in every other aspect of our life, right? Like you have plans on how you're going to succeed financially. You have plans for your kids. You coach them in certain ways, right? You have plans at the job. You're prepared in different ways for what might come into your life. Why don't we, why don't we do the same thing with our sexual purity, knowing that it's going to come? knowing that we will all face sexual temptation. And if the statistics are right, many of us will fail the test. Um, statistics are somewhere between 30% and 70% of every married person uh, is unfaithful to their spouse. And you're like, well, which one is it, 30 or 70? That's kind of a big spread. I don't know. I, I, it's probably because when they're polling people, people probably aren't too honest with that question. But regardless, it's egregious. Regardless, it ought not to be so. And you guys have heard the statistics that within Christians' homes, it's not all that much different than within pagan homes. One statistic I read is that 74% of married men and 68% of married women admit that they would cheat if they knew that they would not get caught. Goodness gracious. This is sin against God. And we need to see it as such. And so I would ask you to consider, to, to even play stuff out in your mind of different situations that might happen so that you're better prepared. Like I can only imagine that Joseph maybe did that. Maybe that's why he was able to say no. And I guarantee you he did that after that first time because it was day after day after day that she continued to approach him. All right? He's like, I wonder what she's going to do today. I wonder how sexy she's going to be. Like, I wonder what she's going to be wearing today. I wonder what she's going to say today. I wonder how she might try to touch me today. And here's what I would say. For you young people in here, it's the same thing for you. I'm not trying to make this weird, but you guys are all teenagers. Um, you guys are growing up in a day and age where you need to be prepared to stand up for what's right. Um, you guys are going to, you know, a few years from now or even a few months from now, for some of you, you may be dating. Um, and praise God for that. But here's what comes along with that is a lot of sexual temptation because the norm in our society today is that sex is just what happens between people that are dating. Yeah, we're dating. Of course we have sex. That's what everyone does. It's not what God says. God says that sex is confined between one man and one woman within the covenant union of marriage. That's God's playground within there, okay? Sex is a great thing if it's done within the context that God sets it up for it to be enjoyed in. I'm not trying to make you guys uncomfortable, but here's what I know. You will face that temptation, okay? You find yourself someone that you like, you're hanging out with them, you're dating them. All right? Weird things start happening, man. There's weird things that happen in your body when you're with someone that you love, that you feel strongly about. And the temptation will be strong to do that which you ought not to do. And you need to prepare yourself in the back seat, at the car, or at, at the park, that I will not give in to what God says is sin. I will draw a line, and listen, that line is not just sex, okay? Sexual morality is a lot more than just sex. But I will draw that line, and I will hold fast to that line, and I will ask that God will give me the courage, and God will give me the strength and the heat of that moment to say no, to refuse, and to honor God. I know it's awkward. Like, a lot of you guys don't even want to make eye contact with me right now. But you have to have the thought before it happens. You have to be prepared. Like James taught on the armor of God a few months ago, right? We put on the full armor of God knowing that the war is going to be waged for our soul. 
And sexual temptation is a huge part of that. I want to say this as well. Is that I know that there's, there's plenty of us who have failed to live up to God's standard for sexual purity. All of us, right? Because God's standard is like, you look at a woman in lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. All right, guilty, failed. We've all failed to one degree or another. Some of us in our minds, some of us in our bodies. But here's what I would tell you is that if you have committed that sin, that God's not done with you. In fact, like that's what's encouraging about the Bible, right? Like we got Joseph and we got Daniel who are like two guys who are like stand-up dudes, right? Like, man, they just seem to be strong and had got it all right. And like everyone else in the Bible is a mess, right? And they like, they gave into temptation, sexual temptation, and God still used them. Um, there can be a lot of guilt and shame that can accompany your sexual sin. And that's from the enemy. That's from the enemy to try to get you to believe that God cannot use you anymore. You're a failure. Why, why would God possibly use you when you can't even... You gotta be careful. Um, we confess. We drag it out into the light. We repent. And then we receive forgiveness. Because that's what Jesus is. He's a forgiving Savior. And then he uses us, right? He, he molds us, he changes us, he prepares us to be the men and women that he would use further on for his namesake. Um, gosh, it's just, it's just so clear right here, right? And I just, I didn't want to gloss over it. Um, we need to be men and women who are pursuing purity at all cost because it will destroy us. So the rest of the story goes like this. He runs out, runs right out of his coat. Second time, by the way, that this brother has lost his coat. Right? I'm getting pretty frustrated about that. Um, and she's had enough. She's done pursuing and she cries rape. Right? She's like, hey, this stupid Hebrew slave that you hired came in, tried to seduce me, tried to get me to sleep with him. I screamed, and he left his, his cloak here and ran away. And Potiphar is like, dang. Uh, and I, honestly, I don't even know if he believed his wife at this point. But what are you going to do, right? He grabs Joseph, and he throws him in the pit. Second time, the brother's been thrown in the pit. He's thrown into jail. He's thrown into prison for something that he did not do. And again, like just like the end of Act 1, we come to the end of Act 2, and everything just looks bleak, right? Like there was hope building, like, hey, maybe God's at work. Maybe God is redeeming. Maybe God's not done with Joseph. And by no fault of his own, thrown back down into the pit, into complete slavery. And so the main point, the main point last week, if you remember, was that the story isn't over, right? It's not over till the fat lady sings. It's not over till the credits are rolling down the screen. Even when your life looks completely bleak, even when you find yourself in situations that you never imagined you would be in, situations that you wouldn't wish upon your worst enemy, God's not done with you. The story's not over. We can find hope in that. The main point this week is that God is with you. God is with you regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of, of, of where you are, unexpected, unplanned. God is with you. That's what we see four times in this chapter alone. If you still have it open, look at, look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. Verse 3. Uh, his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor. Uh, verse 23, 
the Lord was with Joseph, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Over and over and over again, we see the Lord was with Joseph. Um, I don't know if this is going to work or not. I had this thought because sometimes when we go to Chick-fil-A, uh, we, we play a game in the car. When we go through the drive through we try to see how many times we can get the employee um, to say what? My pleasure. My pleasure. Right? Like, that's what they, they have to say that. You say thank you. They say my pleasure. And so we'll play a game where, like, let's see if we can beat our record, right? And so they take our order, and I, you know, hand the card, and he hands it back, and I say thank you. He says, my pleasure. And then receipt, thank you. And I pull around to the window, and they give us the drinks. Hey, thank you. My pleasure. Give me the food. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Right? Over and over. This is what we have here in this chapter. Over and over, he wants to get into our thick skulls that God is with us. No, it says God is with Joseph. Yeah, but God is no respecter of persons. Right? God is unchanging. That's what we call the immutability of God. He's unchanging. What's true for Joseph is true for you. If you are a child of God, God is with you. And you might say, it doesn't seem like it. Okay, but God's with you. Well, it doesn't feel like it. Like, I can't feel him. Okay, but God's with you. Well, well this, isn't, this isn't what I planned. Like, like, I'm so far away from home and everything I know. Yeah, but God's there too. He's everywhere. He's with you. Yeah, but you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand the sin that I've engaged in. You don't understand how far away I've run, the things that I've done. Okay, well, stop doing those things. But God's with you. This is, this is like the, one of the biggest themes of the entire book, the entire Bible. God is with his people. We see it in the very beginning. God is walking the garden with Adam and Eve in perfect fellowship. And then sin breaks that perfect fellowship, but God is still with us, right? We see all, all throughout, like every, every character, God is with Noah. We see God is with Abraham. We see God is with Isaac. We see God is with Jacob. We see right here, God is with Joseph. We see God is with David. And then we have the temple, right? Like that's the whole point of, or the tabernacle was the presence of God dwelling among his people. And then they build the temple, uh, a fixed sanctuary for God. And then the temple is destroyed, but guess what? Jesus. We turn the page and, and God comes down, um, the incarnation, Emmanuel, which means God with us. God walking this earth with his people and then God, Jesus, is, is crucified, buried, risen, and before he ascends, he's like, hey, I'm going away, I'm not going to be with you anymore, but the Helper's going to come. Holy Spirit's come, and it's going to be better for you that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. And that's where we find ourselves now. We're on this side of the Testament, right? We have the gift of the Holy Spirit in us, with us. This is the promise of God. You cannot, if you are a child of God, you cannot run away from God. You cannot do something to, to have God withdraw His presence from you. He's with you. And so, regardless of where you find yourself today in your life, regardless of how unexpected that it is, work hard, resist temptation, especially sexual temptation, and rest, rest, you can rest knowing that God is with you. He will never leave you. He will not forsake you. God is with you. And sometimes we just need to hear it over and over and over to believe it. God is with you. He's with you. Father, we thank you for that truth. Thank you for the reminder. We do need to be reminded because we are prone to discouragement. We're prone to feeling like we don't even deserve your presence. We're prone to believe in the lies of the enemy that we've done so much that you couldn't possibly still be with us. But Father, we trust your word. Over and over and over again, we see that you are with us. And so, Father, we take great comfort in that. We take great joy in that. We find peace in that. And, Father, we find confidence in that to go about and do the work that you've called us to do. And, Father, we ask by your Spirit within, within us that you would give us strength to work hard. And, Father, that you would give us courage to resist temptation. 
Father, would you do those things for us? In the name of Jesus, amen.